Hello, hello. Hello, Tim. Welcome. My name is Rick Spratley, and I'm the president of Pharos. And tonight I feel quite clerical. I feel like our friend down the street probably feels Tokaska when he looks around and sees faces he hasn't seen for a whole year. <laughs> it's really nice to have so many people here, and we certainly know what sells. <laughs> this is this is Pharaoh's annual musical event, something that grew into into a tradition when I wasn't watching. And it's really a great pleasure to be able to do something with modern and traditional music every year. I think I told you before, next year is, is already planned. And it's going to, I'll give you a warning, it's going to be in March, not in April. Because Linda and I are going to be away for the May furrows, and there was no way I was going to miss it. So that's, that's one of the perks of being the guy who's uh, and has the job of organizing it. And it's going to be a couple of musicians from Seattle, a musician named Hank Bradley, who plays every instrument that has strings. And he's going to walk us through what I'm tentatively calling Lutes Over Europe. And he'll start with the bazooki, but show how it's part of a much larger family that began, who knows where it began, but includes oots and everything else across Eastern Europe. So that's next March. Now, the other thing that you know is I have to put a strong arm you that Faros is an organization that people belong to and they pay a small membership fee. Those of you who are casual drop-ins tonight, I would ask you to make a small donation in one of the Greek fisherman's hats that I'm going to <laughs> pass around. Now, we're going to hear Loretica, the music of the down and out, the music of the hashish dens of Izmir, of Constantinople, and finally of Piraeus and the big cities of Greece. And it was played and sang in dives, in teques, in tavernas, and it always involved drugs or alcohol. Now, I can't offer you drugs, <laughs> but thanks to the generosity of Mr. Kamidis, the Consul General in Vancouver, we are offering you Uzo. Wow. <laughs> of course, though, so indeed. And this will be coming around as, as the evening progresses. <laughs> and we'll serve the musicians first. <laughs> And because in Greece, where drinking is much more civilized than it is in North America, there's always food connected. I, we have some nuts to go around as well. <laughs> and, yes. Okay, so with all that, and no further ado, may I turn it over to George Yoldasis and Revma. I looked up Revma in my Greek dictionary, and it sort of said something about being downstream. But I assume that doesn't mean they're all washed up. <laughs> They'll explain. Welcome, Revma. So we're gonna, uh, so we've chosen four singers, and so we've all, um, we're all gonna take turns talking about uh, the particular singer that we've chosen. Um, only like a four or five minute little talk, and we are going to start in chronological order. Um, Dan is going to talk about Rosa Eskenazi, and she was born in 1890. Um, so I'll let you take the floor, Dan. Check, check, okay. Hi, everybody. Rosa Eskenazi, whose birth name was Sarah Eskenazi, was born in Istanbul to Sephardic Jewish parents. Can you hear me? Louder, sorry. Her actual birth date is unknown and is believed to have been between 1895 
and 1897, although she reportedly told people it was 1910. <laughs> Her family was very poor and decided to move to the growing city of Thessaloniki around 1900. The family lived in Komotini, a small city near Thessaloniki, where her father worked in a cotton mill. Uh, her education, and, or sorry, her mother began work as a maid for a wealthy family, with Rosa joining her with the housework. Rosa had no formal education, and her parents entrusted her to a local girl who taught her how to read and write. One day, while Rosa was working, she was overheard singing by the owners of a Turkish nightclub who were amazed by her voice. They came by immediately and asked Rosa if she could sing at the club. Her parents would not allow it. However, Rosa already had dreams of becoming a singer and a performer. When the family moved into Thessaloniki, they lived near the Grand Hotel Theater, where Rosa became acquainted with many of the performers, and she herself became a dancer. While still a teenager, Sara Skinazi fell in love with Yanis Zardinis, a wealthy man from one of Cappadocia's most prominent families. His family disapproved of the match, considering her to be of loose moral character. <laughs> Nevertheless, the two of them eloped around 1913, and Sarah changed her name to Rosa, the name by which she was known throughout her career. Zardinidis died due to unknown circumstances around the year 1917, leaving Rosa with a little child. Realizing that she could not maintain her career as a performer while raising an infant, she brought him to a nursery in the city of Xanthi. His father's family agreed to support the little boy. Rosa moved to Athens by herself and teamed up with some Armenian cabaret artists who recognized her singing skills and introduced her to composers <coughs> and record executives. Her first mentor was Panayotis Tundas, himself an Asia Minor refugee and one of the most successful record producers uh, Greek language recording has ever known. As well as a prolific composer and arranger of popular music, uh, his discovery of Rosa changed her life. She made her first recordings around 1930. Rosa worked with all the greatest composers of the first generation, music composers, including Vangelis Papazoglu, Spiros Peristeris, Kostas Skarbelis, and Marcos Vambakaris. She sang in Greek, Turkish, and Armenian. Many of her best recordings feature Dimitrios Sensis, known as the best violin in the Balkans. She continued working with second generation composers such as Manolis Hyotis. This was not the bouzouki and harmony vocals rebetica that became popular later in the 1930s. Eskenazi sings solo, frequently with the use of rubato, to the free accompaniment of ouds, occasional guitars, and the searing, soaring sounds of a violin. <clears throat> the subject matter, though, is pure rebetica, smoking water pipes in hashish dens. Um, partying in beer halls, lamenting the debilitory effects of too much cocaine, flirting with the tough guys, gambling, etc. Much of the rest of the lyrics reveal the songs to be more generalized, heartbroken laments, um, although Xenite oh, Menos is a song of exile in foreign lands, possibly the very thing to appeal to the Greek immigrants in the US, where Eskenazi was especially popular. One wonders whether her appeal was because listeners could identify with the lyrics, or whether it was the vicarious appeal of the rogue subculture of Greece. By the 1950s, her career had waned, but in 1954, she traveled to Constantinople and performed at a number of night spots in that city. She followed this tour with a trip to the USA, where she enjoyed great success with diaspora Greek and Turkish audiences. Rosa made several recordings in both countries during these tours. Rosa continued to perform all her life, and like other veteran artists, uh, enjoyed somewhat of a comeback with the revival of interest in the Rebetico songs in the late 60s. She continued to record and perform, appearing live in the 70s with young artists such as Haris Alexiou. She died on December 2nd, 1980. So I'm going to talk about Marika Ninu. 
Uh, Marita was actually born Evangelia Atamian. Uh, she was an Armenian Greek singer. She was most well known as Vasily Tsitsani's muse at the height of Rebetika era in the 40s. She was crowned the new queen of Rebetika as she charmed and captured audiences in Greece and America during her reign. Although her life was short, she only lived about 34 to 37 years, it was jam-packed with all sorts of interesting events. While her family was fleeing the catastrophe of Asia Minor around 1922, from Smyrna to Athens, Evagelia was born during that voyage. The captain named her after the ship. In Athens, she learned to play the mandolin and joined the school orchestra she chanted in the Armenian Church of St. Jacob. At the age of 17, she married and gave birth to a son, but 1947, her husband fled to Thessaloniki on a Soviet ship. And soon after, at 22, she met Nino, who was an acrobat and a juggler. So she kind of went the circus route, and she performed, they performed together as the duo Nino. And then when her son was born, uh, his name was Ovanis, or Yanni, uh, the three of them performed as the two and a half Nino, which is reminiscent of uh, Charlie Sheen show. Uh, it was at this time she changed her name from Evagelia to Marika Nino. During one of her circus performances, she was discovered and referred to the famous bouzouki player Manolis Kjotis. Kjoti had one look at her and he thought he was going to waste his time listening to her sing. Um, of course, he was blown away. In the next five months, she worked with Perpiniades. She performed at the Picas and Florida Club together while she learned the tricks of the trade of show business. She recorded two songs with Hyotis in 1948. Later that year, she landed a job as a singer at the Florida Club after not getting the raise she wanted at Pigals. The year after, she met Tsitsanis, who instantly recognized her talents, and it has been said that Tsitsani was an innovator and a renovator. He took the rebetiko from the lower classes of society to become popular music of all social classes, the music of all Greek people. He introduced a new oriental style by removing the oud, centur, and mandala and replaced it with bouzouki and guitar using western scales. Hadzidakis claimed he was a reincarnation of Bach, Beethoven, and Mozart. <laughs> Marika was one of the first women to sing standing up on stage. She knew how to own the mic and she had an amazing stage presence. So a lot of the female singers today owe a lot of that to Marika. Uh, I do have a video to show you. I hope it'll work. Um, I'll read this and then I'll, I'll show you. Just while you're doing that, has anybody been missed? No, we're, we're good, sorry. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, if you're, if you're wanted here. Marika Nino and Vasilis Tsitsanis performed a pack house at Fat Jimmy's, which was uh, Jimmy to Khodru. <laughs> Have you heard of that place? It's, it was a very well-known place in Athens at the time, and it was like the hot spot, the place to perform. They inspired each other, created some of the most memorable recordings and great songs of the era. Tsitsanis wrote 97 songs in two years with her, very prolific. Their first hit was Ximeroni Quebradiazzi, which, are we playing that one tonight? Yeah. Yes, we are. Okay. Uh, after a gig in uh, Constantinopoli, they had a falling out because Tsitsanis did not apply for a visa because they were supposed to go play in the States. And they, she got really pissed off. She took off without him. And uh, in, after she left, he only wrote 38 songs in three years and then four after that. Marika was diagnosed with uterine cancer at nearly 31 years old. She decided to go to America anyways because she could not pass up the opportunity. She recorded with Liberty Record Company. Uh, she returned to Greece briefly while singing through her physical pain. She went back to the States. Two of her singer friends raised money for her hospital bills. She returned to Greece in 1956 for her final curtain call. Tsitsanis did not visit her in the hospital. 
After her last breath, February 23rd, 1957, he did not attend her funeral. Perhaps he was the one hurting the most. Four years later, he wrote a song about his muse, sang by Kathy Gray. Kiriaki se gnorizo, Kiriaki se hano. Thelo naine Kiriaki kefti putha pethano. Translating to Sunday I met you, Sunday I lost you. I want it to be Sunday when I die. So that's my presentation, but uh, I think that's it. <laughs> Sotiria Bell was born in August. Hello? Hello? Yeah. 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 Okay. Sotiria Bell was born August 22, 1921, and was one of the most renowned Rebetica singers mentioned in many music guides. And she was a contributor to the 1984 British documentary entitled Music of the Outsiders. Bell was born in Chaya, now called Rosia, part of the town of Kalkida, on the island of Evia, and was the oldest of five siblings of a wealthy family. Her grandfather, Sotiris Papa Sotiriu, after he, she, whom she was named, was an Orthodox priest at Shimatari and was extremely fond of her. As a little girl, Sotiria would go to church along with her grandfather and she would absorb the religious sounds of Byzantine hymns. She began singing at the age of three and was soon making her own guitars out of wire and wood and playing them. Her father, Kiriakos Belos, had a grocery store in Neapolis in the northern part of Chalkida. The movie, The Little Emigre, a Prosvivopula, featuring the popular singer Sofia Vembo, uh, was the catalyst that pushed her to pursue an artistic career. On hearing of her daughter's ambitions, her mother, Lenny, beat her because as a conservative woman of that time, she did not want her daughter to pursue an artistic career. However, her father did buy her a guitar and paid for private lessons. In 1940, she decided to move to Athens. Her arrival in Athens coincided with World War II, October 28, 1940, actually, the day Italy declared war on Greece, and a new challenging period started for her. Her family completely lost touch with her until they found her again after seven years, singing with legendary Rebetico composer Vasilis Tsitsanis. In the meantime, she had worked as a servant as, at a wealthy lawyer's house, as a hawker selling pastelli, as a luggage carrier, and many other different jobs. One night, she was working as a waitress in a Rebetico club in the Exarchia neighborhood, uh, of downtown Athens and sang two songs after a bet with a customer. Uh, playwright Kimonas Kapitanakis happened to be there and recognized her genuine talent. He introduced her to Tsitsanis, who instantly became fond of her powerful and melodic voice, 
and with whom she recorded the first of her many 78 gramophone records. In December 1948, after a beating by a group of right-wing fascists, she moved from the Zimi Sokodros Club to the Panagaki, where she worked with legendary Marcos Vavakaris. She sang in the best music clubs of Athens, such as the Rosignol, Zimi Sokodros, at Jimmy, Idra, Triana, Falikron, and many more. As the times changed and Eventico was no longer sought after, Sotiria, like many other artists of her generation, found very little work uh, in the nightclubs. The mid-1960s brought with them a sense of cultural awakening and a newfound interest in Eventico among young people, which peaked in the 1980s. Suddenly, people couldn't get enough of the surviving Rebentis, and Sotiria, with her deep voice, full of emotion and pride, was heard on many recordings and helped usher in a new era for Rebentico. Bellu was not only a talented singer, but also a political activist. Having such an opinionated and strong personality, she joined the Greek resistance against the Axis occupation of Greece during World War II. She was caught by the Nazis, tortured, and then put in prison. In 1944, she participated in the Decembriana as a member of the National People's Liberation Army, or alas for short, Ethnikos Laikos Apelephoreptikos Stratos. During the Civil War, she supported the leftists and she was caught at least once and kept in detention. Members of the extreme right groups never forgave her political stance and her participation in the Cambriana. In one incident, they visited the club Zimi Sokodros, where she was singing on stage with Peristeris, Casimatas, Keromitis, Stelios, Rukunas, and Turkakis, and demanded that she sing a famous right wing song. After her refusal, she was beaten by some six members of the royalist group X, also known as Hites, who threatened to kill her and called her Vulgara, a communist. Years afterwards, she still expressed her grievance that not one man from those in the club and none of her <coughs> colleagues stood up to defend her. In 1938, at the age of 17, she met her future husband, Vagelis Trimuras, a bus driver. Her father arranged her marriage despite her objections because he thought that her husband could tame her. Not the case. Their wedding lasted for only six months as he reportedly abused her, even causing her a miscarriage. Being a hot-blooded woman, during one of their fights, she reacted by throwing vitriol, a corrosive acid, into his face. <laughs> she was sentenced to three years and three months imprisonment. She spent three months in prison at Chalkide before the trial and one month in Averroff prison in Athens. She appealed and her sentence was reduced to six months. After paying for bail, she returned to her hometown where she was treated with hostility and was often beaten by relatives for the embarrassment that she supposedly brought to her family. In her personal life, she had two big weaknesses, gambling and alcohol, which eventually led her to poverty and caused her mental issues. She was treated in a psychiatric clinic on at least one occasion. So Tiria was openly a lesbian in a time when this was practically unheard of. And her talent was, has attracted many celebrities and she, has, she had many famous fans. Among them was the famous Greek painter Yanis Tsaruhis, who would burst into tears each time she listened to her unique voice. Although she was particularly admired by artists, critics and the public, she was alone and ignored toward the end of her life. Only a handful of people supported her in the last stages of her year-long fight with cancer. She died in Athens on August 27, 97, and she was buried according to request in the first cemetery of Athens next to Vasilitsanis. Unfortunately, the government never honored her during her lifetime, perhaps due to her controversial personality. Only after her death was she acknowledged as one of the most original repetico voices that Greece has ever produced. So Tiria, with her deep voice, full of emotion and pride, her struggle and honesty, even when it came to admitting her passion for gambling and women, ensured herself a place not only in the Rebetico charts, but also in the hearts and the minds of those whom she touched during her lifetime, and of those whom she continues to inspire. Speaking is not my strong quality, but here we go. <laughs> okay. Sebus Hanum had the most beautiful voice from the female folk or Laika singers of the time. She began her singing career during the golden age of the Laiko period and produced an unusually small number of records compared with other popular vocalists of the day. She was born September 8th, 
1931 in the village of Kokinogia, which is located just outside the town of Drama in northern Greece. The young Sevasti was from a resourceful family. Her parents, Anesti and Basiliki, were of Bondi descent and refugees from Samsunda, or Samsun, a port city on the Black Sea coast of northern Turkey. She had a brother Stelios from her mother's first marriage. During the occupation, when she was 13 or 14 years old, the family moved to Thessaloniki. During that time, she showed a love of singing and performed at a number of kedra, or nightclubs, against the wishes of her parents. In 1949, Sebasti decided to leave Thessaloniki and travel to Athens, where she debuted in the recording of Omorfi Pireotisa to Costa Kaplani, Mazina to Dak In 1951, while performing at the famous nightclub Zim to Hondru, Fat James, Jimmy, the club owner himself, changed the billboard name to Sebas Hanum to, personally, uh, to personify the many Anatolian flavored songs she performed. There you have some early marketing skills put in place. The word Hanum comes from the word Hanumisa, meaning exotic Turkish woman. Sebas was partnered with the legendary singer Stelios Kazadzidis, both on and off the stage. This was a lesser known relationship that Kazadzidis was in, other than the publicized Kazadzidis Marinella relationship, which began prior to 57. Although Sebas and Stelios never recorded together, they performed live together at many clubs during the early 50s. A statement from Kazadzidis described the main reason of the, their breakup was her dependency on drugs. Uh, Kazazili is quoted by saying, uh, the one that drank very much and wanted most certainly to make me a hasigli, a hash addict, was Sebas Hanum. It had become an addiction for the poor soul. She could not sing without it. Although she had a beautiful voice and a, was a superb artist, she thought that without it, she was worthless. That is why our relationship did not last long. I saw that would it, it would have ruined me if we continued. During the year 1960 to 1961, she traveled to New York where she performed at three clubs on 8th Avenue. Uh, three clubs were Ellen Rakor, Grecian Palace, and Sahara. The 8th Avenue strip was an ethnic casbah scene that was popular for world musicians to perform. I'm sure that is where Jimi Hendrix saw Manolis Hiotis perform, and possibly Bebis as well. Later said in an interview when he was asked, how do you consider yourself as a great guitar player? Jimmy's reply was, you haven't seen this Greek I play. <laughs> During Sebasti's stay in New York, she recorded 12 tracks with the legendary bazooki player Dimitris, nicknamed Bebis because he was short, stay you. Also, not producing many records during his career. Uh, there's a CD that some of his work and Sevas is uh, from the Bebi CD. This is the CD that they recorded. Uh, uh, not yet. Uh, it's okay. <laughs> this piece of work, in my opinion, is, is the quintessential record or CD capturing some of the finest talent coming from Greece during music's golden era where musicians were finally chiseled into greatness from working the nightly grind, giving up their souls for a little money and glory. I'd like to play one song from that CD, <laughs> just for you to identify with Sebas and her beautiful talent, and along with those other fine musicians, just close your eyes, feel the soul in that voice, and imagine how much she needed to sing and the hard life she lived to achieve that dream. The song is, I'll Die My Sweet Love, written by Goodies. Goodies. By the way, we want to thank Abby for doing that wonderful video presentation. Yeah, Ya muka 
Traditional Podiaki wardrobe. Living in abject poverty, she died suddenly May 18, Certain the songs for you from the four different singers Rosa Scandazzi, Marika Nino, Sotiria Belli, Sotos Canum. Uh, do you want the songs? Should we say the songs? Okay. We'll do it as we go as along, we I guess. Okay. okay. So, Marika Nino, Sotiria Belli, quickly introduce the band. On guitar and buzuki, we've got Dan Dittrich. On, on oud, we have George Hiras. On uh, buzuki, we've got George Yoldasis. On I'm going to be playing the Rik and the Baklama. Thank you. 
πως με γέλασες αιτία σου μου την ασκάσες
makan ini. Το τελευταίο βράδυ μου απόψε το περνάω κι όσοι με πικραίναν πολύ τώρα που φεύγω απ' τη ζωή Yo 
Ποιο με πικράναν πολύ τώρα που φεύγω από τη ζωή. Όλου του συγχωρνάω. Όλα είναι ένα ψέμα, μια ανάσα, μια ζωή. Σαν ολοδί κάποιο χέρι. Θα μα κόψει μια ναυγή. Εκεί που πάω δεν περνά το δάκρυ και το Σανά και οι καημοί εδώ θα μείνουν στη ζωή και εγώ θα φύγω μόνη. Όλα είναι ένα ψέμα, μια ανάσα, μια ζωή σαν λουλουδί κάποιο χέρι θα μα κόψει μια ναυγή. Δύο πόρτε έχει η ζωή. Ξέρνησα ένα πρωινό κι ως που να'ρθει το δειλινό από την άλλη βγήκα. Όλα είναι ένα ψέμα, μια ανάσα, μια ζωή σαν λουλουδί κάποιο χέρι θα μας κόψει μια ναυγή. Okay, the next one is also a Sotiria Bellu tune. Uh, Πώς θα περάσει η νοδιά.
around to Sevas Hanum. And this one's called, uh, it's got two names, Ada Esena Siloyeme or Hronya Tora Makria Suliono. Oh yeah, I forgot to mention Dan is also playing Saz. Or it's actually a 
a Greek saz, which is called a tambura. It's tuned, how is it tuned? It's similar to the, it's like, is it similar to the saz? Same tuning as the saz. So it's the Greek version. explained that there was a tradition that the band always had to give an encore.
Tonight I told her that she couldn't do that because this means a lot to me and I wanted to do it myself. I hardly know where to start. Maybe I'd start by saying I really appreciate the sound level. It's a real treat to hear acoustic music and music that's played at a level of And working backwards, I will thank you for the first encore. George knows that Gabby Pouyines, the Kupo Machari, is Linda, and my favorite Rebentico song. Remember going, we used to stay in Exarchia, surrounded by black peddlers and God knows what else, because lots of the Rebentico clubs were around there in the early 90s. And I don't remember, Margarita was with us that year, it was 92 or 93 thereabouts. We used to go to a club called Fargo Sirde Ani, which was upstairs, just around the corner from our dodgy hotel. And it's, music started at 11.30, 12 o'clock at night. And we'd sit there all night long. And they had a really nice woman singer who sang that, sang that song. And it was the first time we heard it. And it's been our favorite ever since. And then we'd stagger home at 5 in the morning. And half an hour later, the garbage men would come around. And I don't know how the Greeks do it. I really, really do At any rate, we have been George Yovasi's groupies thinking back for probably 25 years, <laughs> following him around wherever he plays, with whomever he plays, and we're very privileged to have a virtuoso Suzuki player in town. Thank you so much. Fantastic to have George and Dan with him in this new configuration. That was really, really wonderful tonight. Over the last 25 years, there has been something missing. And that something is the Lorbetisa. <laughs> there are lots of men, Rebetico singers, many famous ones, many wonderful ones, but the ones who really get you right here are all the women. And they've hit on the three great ones, and one I knew nothing about. I'd never heard of Sebas Harum until George emailed me, and I googled her and found nothing, so tonight was a revelation. But, Abby, it was just fantastic to have you take us on that trip. And the thing that dazzled me was that you changed your vocal approach to match each of the singers. When you switched from Rosa Eskenazi to Mara Caminu. I, I had no choice. Yes. <laughs> I was sitting there saying, my God, Mara Caminu just walked into the room. And so you're not a baritone, but when you sang the first notes of Sotoria Bellu, oh. again, yeah. it was, yeah. and, yeah. <laughs> and she 
unless you're totally surrounded by wires and things, I would give her a huge big kiss, but I'll do that afterwards. <laughs> thank you, thank you so much. That was a real treat. And I would like to ask what you're doing two years from tonight. Because <laughs> I, I want to book you for a return visit. <laughs> Coffee, cookies, and I see the usual bottle still there, and there's, there is the mastica. So uh, perhaps you can find it. I can do you. And absolutely. Thank you very much, Mr. Comitas, for getting us all the music. And we'll see you, all of you, in October. Oh, yes. Thank you.